thank you everybody for uh, for being here. Thanks um, to uh, Ana Maria and, and the IDB for organizing the uh, the panel as well. Um, uh, so I, I'm also a political scientist, although I'm not going to apologize for being a political scientist. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, this is also uh, sort of um, a chapter for the project that uh, Mariano mentioned. So trying to take sort of a, uh, a view of the state of the field on um, uh, political parties and the role of inequality. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do and sort of take a, a bit of a descriptive, um, uh, mostly descriptive approach here. Uh, so we've, I think, seen this already, or this has already been uh, discussed, but as uh, a person who sort of focuses a lot on the, the micro level, um, these are some of our data from, from LAPOP. Um, levels of support for redistribution across the region, if you look, this is the most recent face-to-face um, -face survey in 2018-19. Um, we have high levels of support for redistribution. So the question asks whether or not people agree with the statement, government should re reduce income differences between the rich and the poor. Um, so this is a, a sort of standard way of measuring support for government redistribution, uh, and it's very high uh, across the region. Uh, you can see that there are differences between uh, uh, people who are poorer and people who are richer, and this is sort of consistent uh, with sort of a an insight of the Meltzer Richard model. I'm not comparing sort of medians and means here, um, but uh, richer people are less likely to support redistribution, poorer people are, are more likely su to support redistribution. Um, and this is important later on. Uh, so at the same time, we have, um, and Mariano already showed this, sort of low levels of redistribution compared especially to uh, Western Europe, uh, where you get. Uh, typically lower levels of support for redistribution uh, in the public. Uh, so why so little redistribution? Of course, there's lots of uh, sort of arguments out there, and Mariano's already summarized some of them. Uh, the sort of state capacity argument that states are, are simply unable to redistribute in the same way that um, European states have been. Um, uh, there are some prominent arguments in political science on uh, the role of electoral rules and particularly sort of proportional systems versus majoritarian systems. Um, also arguments about uh, ideology and partisanship of government. Um, uh, in some sense, neither of these is, is totally satisfying. We have um, some states, particularly in the southern cone, with relatively higher levels of um, state capacity that still don't redistribute uh, at the same levels that we see uh, in other parts of the world, in, in Europe. Um, we also have electoral rules that supposedly are going to lead to more redistribution. So the, the sort of um, famous work in this uh, area by Iverson and Soskis and others uh, suggested that majoritarian systems like the US, like the UK, are going to redistribute less. Uh, but throughout most of Latin America, we have uh, the kinds of systems that should lend themselves to more redistribution. Uh, weak labor movements is, is another argument, obviously, the sort of um, emergence of the sort of modern um, welfare state coincides with the emergence of um, labor movements in uh, Europe, um, but it also does in uh, parts of Latin America, particularly, again, uh, in the southern cone. We, we do have weaker labor movements in some countries, but actually quite strong uh, labor movements in, in other parts. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, two other arguments uh, in the literature to, to tie this in particular to the role of political parties. Um, one uh, feature of Latin America, and it's uh, a feature of Latin America that is um, fairly persistent, although there's some variation across countries and, and variation over time, uh, is that we have relatively weak parties, particularly as compared to Western European parties. Um, we also have, and this sort of relates to the literature on elite capture, we also have a, a context of a, a certain level of elite capture, which I'm going to sort of characterize in a more kind of micro way in political inequality. That is, um, governments respond to the preferences of affluent um, citizens and, and not to the uh, preferences of poor citizens who are demanding more uh, redistribution. So um, I'll focus on, on those two. And, um, 
rather than sort of summarize all of the literature, sort of show you a little bit of uh, kind of descriptive um, evidence uh, that this is going on. Um, okay, so uh, before I do that, so to start with, with parties, um, why do strong parties matter? And, and there's a, a sort of a, a long literature on this uh, in political science. Um, uh, what we call party system institutionalization. So party system institutionalization is something about the predictability of party systems, that the same parties compete in elections over time. Um, that provides a certain amount of predictability for voters, but also a certain amount of predictability for um, politicians or um, uh, ambitious politicians. That is, that the way to um, have a career in politics is to work through a particular set of political parties uh, and to work your way up the ranks within those political parties, right? This is part of the reason that proportional systems are thought to be uh, sort of more, redistribu more redistributive. Um, so this gives you sort of a, a longer time horizon. It means that political parties have uh, or the leadership of political parties um, has some interest in a sort of longer term uh, ability to um, win office or win over constituencies and um, win elections in the future more than just winning uh, perhaps the next election. Right. Um, so there's predictable patterns of party competition and predictable voter bases, right? Voters are also going to become um, uh, more likely to vote for particular parties. Um, they're going to identify with political parties and, and therefore be sort of reliable supporters. Again, that gives politicians uh, a sort of longer time horizon when they're thinking about um, policy making. Uh, the other feature of why strong parties matters is that redistribution, actual redistribution, right? Policies that um, actually reduce inequality rather than policies that simply redistribute government resources to constituencies, right, to your particular uh, electoral base in the short term, is that you need to, br you need to build broad-based coalitions in order to get sort of universalistic, um, uh, the kind of universalistic social welfare policy that actually uh, reduces inequality, that actually uh, the kind of redistribution that we're interested in. Um, and so in order to do that, uh, and I think the, um, European experience uh, bears this out. Uh, in order to do that, you need um, strong parties committed to building those kinds of coalitions, uh, and these things take a significant amount of time, and, and we get sort of the emergence of uh, large welfare states uh, in the Norways of the world that, that Mariano uh, described. Uh, targeted rewards are less costly for weak parties. You don't have to build a, a strong coalition, a sort of large, um, uh, political coalition in order to create these kinds of policies. Uh, you can simply target rewards in the short term at your particular uh, electoral constituents um, and, and not do it in a way that actually sort of um, reduces inequality necessarily, right? Even if you're a left party, right? Which presumably we think the left is sort of associated with uh, a programmatic commitment to uh, reducing inequality. Um, all right, just to show you a little bit descriptively that these things actually seem to correlate with each other, um, I'm going to look at some measures of party system institutionalization. Um, uh, there's lots of ways and there's lots of debate in the literature on, on how these uh, uh, things should be measured. Um, one way to measure them is simply to look at volatility over time. So one feature of you know the concept that I described is that um, in sort of weaker, uh, weak, weakly institutionalized party systems, we're going to see more turnover of political parties. Uh, we're going to see sort of more fragmentation of political parties, and this is maybe one place where um, Leopoldo and Santiago's uh, uh, sort of um, intuitions differ with the, the kinds of intuitions that, that the literature on party systems has. Um, uh, where turnover, in a sense, is bad, right? Turnover means weak party system institutionalization. Uh, that means there's less predictability in the system, and that means that you're not going to get the kind of sort of broad-based redistribution uh, that we might expect. So, um, uh, so one measure I'm going to look at is electoral volatility. It's not sort of a perfect measure. It doesn't measure all the other sort of pieces of this concept that we might care about. 
Um, the other is Varieties of Democracy, which does sort of expert surveys, uh, has these um, annual, I think, measures uh, of party system institutionalization as sort of a broader concept, uh, and I'll, I'll look at those as well. Um, uh, I'll show you that that correlates um, with inequality. I'm going to look at disposable income inequality, um, like Leopoldo in Santiago, I, I presented this a month ago and, and haven't done a whole lot since, but I did do one thing that Chico asked me to do, uh, which is look at better inequality data, because he didn't like the uh, inequality data that I was uh, using. Um, I'll show you that too, but I, but I, used, I used Nora's data too, so, which everybody likes. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll show you redistribution as well. That's the, it's going to be the percentage change in uh, Gini as we go from market inequality to disposable inequality, right? So taking into account taxes and transfers. Um, so this is what that looks like if you use uh, Nora's data. Uh, which doesn't have a lot of um, as many data points in Latin America and, and, and maybe actually um, as I was sitting here uh, seeing Mariano's uh, stuff on the Norways of the world, maybe sort of looking at the entire uh, world would um, make more sense and, and not just focus on Latin America. But you can see that um, more institutionalized party systems have lower levels of inequality. Um, more institutionalized party systems also uh, exhibit higher levels of redistribution within the sort of band of variation that we have in Latin America, which again is, is sort of lower than um, other parts of the, uh, of the world. Um, so, uh, you know, you might look at that and say, you know, uh, we don't really know where um, party system institutionalization comes from here, and maybe it comes from uh, inequality. Um, uh, I think we know a fair amount about where uh, weak party systems come from. Uh, they are partly a function of the particular rules that we have in Latin America, which is that although we have proportional systems, we also have presidents, unlike um, uh, European political systems. And the combination of presidents with uh, sort of more fragmented um, legislatures is quite different from the parliamentary PR systems that we see uh, in, uh, in Western Europe. And so we get weak parties in part because presidents don't have to have um, strong parties, whereas prime ministers obviously uh, do. Um, we also get weaker parties uh, in contexts of uh, sort of legacies of dictatorship, legacies of, of conflict. Uh, of course, if you look, for instance, at the Brazilian party system was sort of um, taken apart by the dictatorship and, and sort of replaced. Uh, during the dictatorship, of course, has also transformed um, since then. Uh, and I've done some work arguing that the market reforms of the 1980s and 90s also um, uh, substantially weakened party systems uh, across the region. Um, so I don't think there's, a, there's sort of um, obvious theoretical reasons to think that in the short term, high levels of inequality are uh, changing levels of party system institutionalization. Um, even so, so you know, using um, data where we can sort of, you know, at least um, include some fixed effects, uh, and these are the data uh, that um, Chico doesn't like. Um, we still get uh, sort of relationships here, even if we're just leveraging uh, change, uh, sort of year to year, uh, change over time, rather than um, differences across countries. Um, so, yeah, great. Um, uh, so party systems matter and, and weak party systems matter for um, uh, inequality and, and redistribution. Um, and the other thing that matters uh, that I want to talk about is, is political inequality and sort of the, the idea of uh, sort of elite capture. Um, so, uh, so I've done some looking into this and there's a, a kind of burgeoning literature on what political scientists call congruence, the sort of um, relationship between the preferences of voters and the preferences of or the positions of um, elected representatives in legislatures. Um, so we have some work looking at, uh, a co-author and I have some work uh, looking at sort of um, all the countries in the world where we could get some data. Um, there's also uh, a bunch of studies on um, policy responsiveness, looking at sort of um, preferences of voters and uh, policy making that happens subsequent to those uh, sort of um, public opinion surveys. Um, there's a bunch of countries, and this kind of started with 
uh, US data, and, and people have done this for sort of a, a broader set of countries. There's, um, this is a little bit hard to do in, in Latin America because our surveys don't tend to ask policy questions. We tend to ask sort of general, do you like the president uh, questions. We don't ask uh, you know, whether or not you like this particular policy proposal or, or things like that. So it's, um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that in Latin America. But the sort of upshot here uh, is that regardless of kind of how you look at this, elected representatives consistently reflect and respond to the preferences of the rich and, and just about not to the preferences of anyone else, um, uh, sometimes including the middle. Uh, and I'll just show you um, an example of that from Latin America using uh, some of Lampop's data um, from 2010, 2012, and 2014. The reason I chose those years is because it corresponds to some surveys of members of parliament uh, in Latin America from the, the surveys that Salamanca, the University of Salamanca does, the parliamentary elites uh, data set. So we can match uh, the elite respondents, right, the representatives responding to the same questions that were put to uh, public opinion to the masses uh, in the America's barometer. Um, so I'm going to look at economic policy using sort of a, a few items combined into an index. Um, and I'm going to split up citizens by different levels of household wealth, which you know I'm happy to um, to talk about. Uh, and this is what that looks like. So um, what we've done here is we've taken the poorest 20 percent, so up to the 20th percentile. Their preferences here on the economic dimension are normalized to zero within each country, and I'm, I'm averaging across the three um, years that we have. Um, the circles that you see here are the preferences of the top 20th percentile, so the, the 80th percentile and up, the top 20th per, 20% of citizens. You can see that almost everywhere their preferences are to the right, right? Sort of um, less uh, government intervention in uh, economic policy making, right? Or eco the economy, let's say, less interventionist, um, with the exception of Argentina, uh, which is curious, uh, interesting, and Honduras. Um, just about in every case, if you look at the squares, those are the preferences of the elected representatives when asked the same questions. And you can see that sort of across the board, um, those people are even further to the right, sort of uh, less supportive of uh, government intervention in the kinds of things that, um, that might reduce uh, inequality. Uh, and again, there's some interesting uh, sort of differences, Bolivia in this period and uh, things like that. But this is consistent with the kinds of things we see um, in, in other parts of the world uh, as well. Um, so, you know, you could take this as sort of micro evidence of, you know, elite capture or, or something like that. Um, but, but it's also, I think, not obvious uh, that um, uh, declines in uh, um, the strength of parties has really undermined this, or that's something that, that I think is maybe a, a bit of a tension between the, the two papers. Um, so, uh, you know, one way of explaining the under provision uh, that I think political scientists have increasingly been working on um, is, uh, is to focus on weak parties uh, and political inequality um, as explaining the, the persistent economic inequality that we see in the region. Um, there's uh, implications here for uh, public opinion. I think um, uh, to the extent that these things have um, persisted over time or possibly even increased over time, and there's some debate in the literature on, on whether this has always been true or, or has been sort of more true, um, it does seem to be correlated with uh, people's perceptions. So people are aware that their elected representatives are not responding to the kinds of things uh, that they're demanding, and, and that is also correlated with support for political outsiders, populism, uh, the kinds of things that we tend to see, lower trust in government, uh, and, and things like that. Um, uh, and uh, as I said a month ago, there are some things I, I still want to do, possibly sort of doing this um, subnationally within um, Argentina or Brazil, where we can get um, uh, lower level inequality data. Uh, the political inequality sort of measures uh, that I've shown you, um, you know, to the extent that it sort of stays in this chapter at all, um, it, it, I think what, I, what I'd like to do is look at this by parties and party systems uh, to be able to link that back to this idea of weak parties uh, and strong parties. Uh, but I'll leave it there. Look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks.